All right, homework. So you're calculating CL of the airplane for the fin and due to the wing dihedral. So the fin just has a formula and you plug in uh, because, um, yeah, because we calculated the area of the fin and the location of the aerodynamic center and all that. So you should get a radian. And I gave you all the numbers that go in there, right? In the text below. So for which one? Yeah, so you go and grab that from from the other homework. Wingspan's 42, right? Yeah, and the wing area is 400. So you stick all that into the formula, should get that number there. Yeah, so then for the wing uh, contribution, you have to go to appendix B.9, and it gives you this big formula. And so what's confusing about this is just figuring out which charge to go for or what. And you have to look at the section in the text below that and realize that you need B.9, comma 1 for that thing. Uh, no compressibility. So that's 1. And that's what I specified in the problem. This thing comes from B.9, comma 3. And this thing comes from B.9, comma, 4. But that's explicitly told in the textbook. You just see the formula, and it tells you where to find all this stuff. So these are chase around charts. You have to go find that in the chart, that in the chart, and that in the chart. And then no twist. So that drops out all that other stuff in the formula. Yeah. Do you have to do what with the table? Yes, copy the tables. Just like before, copy the, the figure that I'm going to show you. Mark where you picked your point. In what? Um, I can't control that. Does anybody have a PDF of the figures? So you're saying that the the ebook that you bought doesn't have this? It's missing a page. So you need to sue them. I don't know. Um, so you're saying that that you didn't get what pages? Because somebody emailed. Maybe it was you that emailed me, and I was like, "What the heck are you talking about?" Which one? Yeah, page 343 and 344. All right, well, I will, I will. So you need the pages with the figures, essentially. All right, I'll try to get those scanned in and posted, and then I'm going to send the publisher a bill.
But yeah, I, don't, I thought your question was, do you need to copy them and then include them in your submission? And the answer is yes. And mark the points. So, oh, and so you need CL to go in here. Yeah, I thought that whoever emailed me, I thought you were saying that the pages were missing in your book. And I've never seen that in the hard copy being missing any pages that we needed. Okay, so if you calculate CL, this is just CL trim, so you should get 1.184 for the weight that I gave you there. Yeah, this is the low speed, 170, okay. So make sure you got that because you're gonna have to multiply that there. Yeah, so the first figure you need is B.9, comma 1. And you're doing the lambda equal 0.5 value. So the taper ratio for the wing is 0.5. And that came from homework number one. And you read at the sweep angle of 8 point, whatever it was, the 8 degree sweep. So that comes down here. And then the aspect ratio was four point something, right? 4.41. So you got to get those three values coming into this chart because this is from wind tunnel tests for a bunch of different wings and aspect ratios. So make sure you mark your point that you pick on that. Check. Um, you should get a number for that. So this one here, I got about that value, does that make sense? Yeah, because it's, it's between zero, zero, 001 and zero on the chart. Okay, and then on the next chart, set of plots. Don't use that one, because there's no compressibility, unless you just want to be an overachiever. Now, don't worry about that one. And then this is B.9, comma 3. So that's this one here. And what is 0025? Is that what we're reading from that? No, 0125. And that's negative as well. So far, so good. Make sure you show that chart and the point that you picked. Again, you need the taper ratio and the aspect ratio to read off of this. And then the last chart you need, again, lambda 0.5, aspect ratio 4.4, and then you read off the value here for a sweep angle, a half chord sweep angle of eight point something. So there you get triple O one seven five. So make sure you show the work on all of that. Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Exactly. 
No, so I mean, you're reading from a chart, so within 10%, like best you can read from the chart. So I don't expect you to hit exactly that number. Although now I've given you the number so you could hit it, right? Yeah, yeah, no, so go with what you read as long as it's close to this. All right, and then you stuff into this formula and you plug in CL and plug all those numbers and you should get a CL beta. of this value. And again, make sure you show your work on that formula for the vertical tail. Make sure you show your formula, the numbers plugged in, show your calculations, show all the charts, write this equation out so that you know what you did when you look at it a month from now. Calculations. Yeah, that's per degree what I do. Oh, it's because all of those were per degree from the charts, right? So this is per degree. Sorry about that. Yeah, and then per rating, it's minus 0.1857 if you convert it. And then you simply add the two together, the vertical tail effect and the wing effect to get the total. So you can see there's a lot of work. The vertical tail is pretty straightforward because it's just a surface and we know how to predict the force on that. And then we have the moment arm and then you just multiply the two together and you get that, that effect. The wing's much more complicated because the airflow around it is generating lift and all kinds of things. And it's, it's just a complicated airflow. So we have to go to the wind tunnel charts for this. The only way to get around this not have a wing. I mean, you can, don't twist your wing like if you wanna build an airplane and you're trying to escape from some bad guy and off a cliff, right? So don't twist your wing. Probably wanna put some dihedral in it because you want some bank angle stability, but you still gotta calculate this, so. If you ever get captured and you have to escape, make sure you take your textbook with you. So that <laughs> you can ask, no, you, you would build an airplane and you'd hope for the best, right? You, throw some, you have some idea, well, I need a vertical tail, let's stick it back there. I need a wing of so, so much size, some stability. Sorry, what? Yeah, um, there was a, actually a show called MacGyver a while back where he built an airplane to escape from a guy, I think it was in Columbia, and he flew off a cliff and somebody actually did an aerodynamic analysis than an airplane because it was like bamboo frame with trash bags covering the wings and the trash bags were real loose so really they just flapped and created drag but it made a good show let's see then the next part is uh, the airplane in a side slip So let me, I'll leave this on the board there because I forgot to stop screen sharing. So what I added was the number here. Well, we did that before, right? So this is the final value that you use to calculate. And then here's the numbers that I wrote up here for the values that you got from the chart. Sorry about that for you guys on Zoom. So let me give them a minute to copy those down. I should get out of the way. So while we're waiting on that, I heard some of you guys talking about the, the latest SpaceX launch. I didn't see that one. We watched the other one in my four o'clock Monday, Wednesday class. And that one looked like it landed okay. I heard the landing gear collapse partially and then eventually it exploded. Have any volunteers to go to Mars yet from you guys? If they do what? Have they? Yeah. 
you know, at one point they were looking for compatible couples to go to Mars and you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we're good. Hopefully people got that copied down. So the first thing on this one is you have to calculate the side slip. So I want you to draw a picture. So make sure you draw a wrong letter. Make sure you draw this picture. Because I'm going to look for it. I'm going to grade for it. So I want you to draw a picture because a picture is worth a thousand words, right? I don't know if this picture is worth a thousand words because it's not that great, but here we go. So again, I want you to visualize the fact that in a side slip, the airplane's moving partially sideways. So the side velocity is 50. The total velocity is 170 miles per hour. So obviously you got incompatible units here, so you have to convert this to 249, 33 feet per second. So make sure you do that. And then beta is just this angle, so you use <coughs> the sine of beta is equal to 50 over that. So what we're doing is we're wanting to deflect the rudder to counteract the yaw produced by the side slip so that we can keep the side slip going. It's, we don't want it to reduce the side slip back to zero. And so it's going to want to go that way. So we're going to end up hopefully getting a rudder like that to counterbalance it. And because the, the yaw equation has both aileron and rudder and side slip in it, we have to solve the two equations in two unknowns. So we have to solve the roll equation and the yaw equation. For rudder and aileron simultaneously. You guys can do that. That's algebra. So you should get a rudder of 0.19385 radians and an aileron of 0.19385. And you might say aileron. Well, what happens is that if you throw in that much rudder, which is like 11 degrees, if you have that much rudder, because of the vertical tail and rudder are above the CG, you get roll due to the rudder in addition to the yaw. So that's the coupling. You get both roll and yaw from the rudder. And so you got to throw in some aileron to counteract the, the roll due to the rudder. All right, if you do not see the sections in the book scanned in by the middle of the afternoon, shoot me an email because it meant I forgot to do it. Can you do that? Because you're needing it, right? Or did you get it from somewhere else? Okay, I appreciate it.
Okay, we were solving the mass spring damper differential equation. The thing we did was we said that we pulled the mass over and held it still, and then at time t equals zero, we let go. So we moved it over to here. And it had a tendency to come back, so it was stable, statically stable. And we calculated the, the motion. It slid right back over and stopped. So this is the homogeneous solution. And so now we want to look at a forced problem. So here we're going to start out at equilibrium. No... Uh, velocity. So we're starting out unstretched spring at t equals zero, but then at time t equals zero, we kick on a force of 25 newtons. So that means that we have no string string spring force and no damping force at equilibrium because it's not stretched and there's no motion. But now we have a force of 25 suddenly turned on. So now what's going to happen? Which way is the mass going to move? Newton's law unbalanced force is going to move to the right. Then what's it going to do? Spring is going to stretch, right? And it's going to stretch and stretch and stretch until it's stretched enough that the spring has a um, force of 25. And the spring constant we used in our example was 25, and that's why I picked 25. So it means it's going to slide over one meter. So that one meter times 25 is going to balance out to 25 there. So what we expect intuitively and just doing some calculations is that it's going to slide over to a new position. Will it slide over and stop or will it overshoot and then bounce around before it finally stops at the new position? So there's going to be a new turn on this, uh, this force. And in fact, if we write the differential equation, we can see that automatically. Uh, 12 is the damping. This is K over M. And so at the new equilibrium, X double dot is going to be zero and X dot is going to be zero because we're going to say it's going to stop there. And so you can see that if the force is 20, then X is going to be one meter. So that's our new equal. Well, let's find out what the dynamics are. So the math guys say, all right, we need the homogeneous solution, which we already did. It's the solution of that thing with zero on the right side. So we have the homogeneous solution Like that, we did that last time, right? So you might say, well, we found C1 and C2 last time. And we did, but we found those for a different set of initial conditions. That was where we pulled it over, right, and held it. So we got to leave those open. And now we need a particular solution.
to match this with the force turned on. And the best thing to do in this situation is to choose a constant because f of t is a constant. If you remember that from differential equations, you can try something here that looks like what the input is because the input is what's driving it. If we had a sinusoidal input, let's say we pushed and pulled, and pulled with a certain frequency back and forth with that frequency and so you would try a particular solution that was sinusoidal and then get it to work remember so really this is a guess based on what this thing looks like that's all you really do so if we plug that into the differential equation All right, so there's the F. We're gonna plug this constant in here. And so the double derivative of a constant is zero. The single derivative of a constant is zero. The no derivative of a constant is just the constant. And so this tells us what this constant that we assumed was gonna work, and it actually does work. And notice that this validates our choice because if we choose a constant here, then this side becomes a constant and that's gonna match the constant over here. If this forcing function had been sine, you can see why we would need some sines and cosines over here to get that to match, right? All right, so the whole deal then, x, means we add the homogeneous solution plus the particular solution. I'd say, well, why does that work? But it makes sense because the first part, the homogeneous solution, if you plug that into the differential equation, you're gonna get zero, right? And then you plug the second part in, the particular solution, and you're gonna match the right-hand side, and so that's why it works. So now we just have to figure out C1 and C2, and we do those from the initial conditions. So we have to calculate X, at zero is going to be zero and x dot at zero is going to be zero and so x at zero is going to be e to zero so that's one e to the zero is one plus one so that's c1 plus c2 has to equal one there's one equation and the derivative here, we've got where I've plugged in for t equals zero now. And then the derivative of this constant is zero. So this gives us a second equation, the sum for C1 and So you go through the algebra. That's your solution.
Ja. Let me check it. Does it sound like it's on to you guys? I hear it kind of echoing. I'll try to stick the antenna out and see if that helps. So then the whole deal is So let's check a couple of assumptions we made early on. We said that we're going to turn on the force and the mass is going to slide to the right. So the first question is where does it go to? Mathematically, where does it go to means what happens when time gets large? If we let this thing run and it slides over after a long period, where is it going to be? So what's the answer to that? When time gets large, e to the minus 2.683 times big time goes to zero, right? e to the negative number, it goes down to zero. And then this other deal times big T, that goes to zero as well. And so we're left with one, which is, makes sense because then the forces are balanced. The spring stretches by one, gives you 25 backward, which matches the 25 forward. Okay, question number two. What is the motion like? Does it slide over and stop or does it bounce back and forth? What do you think? These exponential functions, we said they go to zero. E to the something like times T looks like that, right? There's one. And so that looks like it just slides over and then stops as those things go to zero, right? What kind of function would we expect to see in our formula if it did this? Oh, that's, sorry, that's not right. We draw that. Right, we're starting out at zero. So what kind of a function would we expect to see if we saw that? What kind of a function does wiggly thing? Function sine or cosine, right? And the frequency would be the number times t. So it'd be like sine of omega t, where omega is the frequency. We don't see that. We see exponential, so that tells us it's it's damped, it's not oscillatory, and it just slides over and stops. And in fact, if you plot this total function in Excel like we did last time, if you plot x versus time, it goes up and stops at one. And if you plot x dot versus time, it starts out at zero velocity, it comes up to a peak velocity, and then the velocity goes back down and it stops. That's just a plot of that, that whole function there. So we could continue on with this example. And in fact, we could get oscillatory behavior, and I'll show you that when we get into this more. If we reduce the damping to six rather than 12, kept the spring the same, so now the spring's still the same stiffness, but we have less shock absorption, less velocity absorption, it will slide over and overshoot and go back and forth. 
And in fact, we'll look at, well, what is the response for different values of B? Like we'll do, we did 12, we'll do eight, six, and so on. Um, but as I think most of you learned in differential equations, there's another way to solve differential equations. That's kind of just a cookbook process where there's no, well, guess the particular solution and assume this and that. You just follow the steps and you're done. Kind of like cooking a pie. Laplace transforms, did you guys get exposed to that? So that's the way most people solve differential equations, especially in system analysis of controls. And you'll do a lot of that in 607. So we do a little bit of that. So the next thing we're gonna do is an intro to that. Looks like we'll just barely get started, but that's okay. Sorry. So these are Laplace transforms and what they do is they transform a differential equation which has derivatives into an algebraic equation that we all know how to solve. And the way this works is you have a function of time over here and you transform that using the transform. The way we indicate, help us keep track of whether we're in time or, or this S domain is over there we use lowercase and over here we use uppercase. It's just kind of a mnemonic device. So the Laplace transform of F of T, we call capital F. And the way you get there is you do this integral. So you multiply F by E to the ST. And the guy that invented this, I think, chose this because that's the traditional um, non-Laplace differential equation method, right? You assume E to the ST. So somehow he figured out, well, if you do this, you're gonna get the same result. So you take your function, F or X or whatever, you stick it in here and do the integral. <clears throat> and This side is called the D Laplace domain because your variable is S. And over here, it's called the time domain because your variable is T. Because the integration gets rid of the T but replaces it with an S that's an unknown. So an example, is what do we take, what if we take the Laplace of like one of the solutions that we get, e to the something a times t. So the way you do that is you just stick it into the definition. And then carry out the integration Right, remember S is just a constant. It just goes along for the ride, although it's a variable in the final result. For the integration, T is the variable. Right, so if I integrate it, I get minus one over S plus A, because if I go backwards, I differentiate this, I get minus S plus A, it's gonna cancel that out and give me back what I started with. and evaluate these at zero and infinity. So 
So that's first lemma gives me e to the negative infinity. This is e to the zero. So that's that thing at zero and that thing at negative infinity. And of course, negative infinity goes to zero and this is just one. And so this says the Laplace transform of that thing, e to the minus a t, is one over s plus a. And it's bi-directional. If we were given this thing in the Laplace domain and we said, well, what's the time function that goes with that? We simply match it backward because we know if the Laplace of that gives us this, then the inverse Laplace of this going backward gives us that. So that would be written as the inverse Laplace of one over S plus A is E to the minus A T. And in fact, typically you don't use integrals like this. You just have a table. And so we'd stick that one in our table so we have to know how to deal with that. And then there's a bunch of other ones. Um, so on Blackboard, I've posted an in, a couple um, copies from different textbooks of introductions to Laplace transforms uh, for your review. So there's nothing in our textbook about Laplace. They use it, but there's no intro. And so make sure you grab the notes on Blackboard, the handouts, and look through those. And in one of those, there's a really good table of the Laplace transforms. How are we doing on time? Let's do uh, one more function. I think we have time to do that. So that mass spring damper problem where we turned on a force at time t equals zero, right? We said, okay, there's no force. And then at time t equals zero, we turn on 25. Mathematically, that's called a unit step. So we wanna be able to Laplace that kind of thing because we wanna be able to do those kind of inputs. And so the unit step is a function that's zero all the way up until t equals zero. And then it goes up to one. And then we could get our 25 force by just doing 25 times this thing. Um, and it's called u s of t step. So it's zero except for time bigger than one or bigger than zero. So what's the Laplace of that thing? If we want to re represent that kind of an input turning on, plug it into the formula. Nice and convenient because this thing is zero until time zero, which is the start of our integral, and then it turns on. So this is just one. So the integral of e to the st is minus one over s e to the st, throw in the limits. And we get zero because we're gonna have e to the, I lost my minus, we have e to the minus infinity, and then minus a minus e to the zero. So it turns out the unit step function on the Laplace side is just one over s. And if you see a one over S on the Laplace side, you know that that turns back into this unit step. Another important uh, function is an impulse that would represent, let's say we hit the mass with a hammer. So a whole bunch of force is applied over a very short period that applies an impulse to it. 
Um, and so we'll Laplace that one next time. And then I'll list in a table a whole bunch of the different ones that you'll usually use. But again, grab the stuff from Blackboard. Um, and the next homework will is doing some Laplace transform uh, homework problems. Yep. The formulas, yeah, I'll give you a Laplace transform table that will go with it. Yeah. 